Welcome to Scholarly Sedition on the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network. This is your host, Andrew Krishon, and today we'll be discussing a few different topics related to the non-aggression principle. Specifically, at first, in the first segment of our show, we'll be discussing the vert fry nature of economics, which is something that is a topic that should be more discussed widely among libertarians and those who adhere to the non-aggression principle, I think, to distinguish between economics and libertarianism, and specifically Austrian economics and libertarianism. And I think a lot of the fault for this failure to distinguish between economics and libertarianism, libertarianism being a moral sentiment, a moral philosophy, the non-aggression principle being a moral philosophy. And obviously, we wouldn't be libertarians if we didn't agree that the non-aggression principle produced at least some some physical standard of economic well-being, right? If everyone was going to starve under libertarianism, and we knew this, <clears throat> even if we thought libertarianism was moral, it it would certainly be a difficult thing to accept. But luckily, this isn't the case. We don't have to wrestle with our internal demons between morality and economics because economics is typically on the side of the non-aggression principle and libertarianism. One prominent school of economics, which is widely adopted by libertarians, is the Austrian school of economics. This is a school of economics which I myself adhere to. Um, apart from this podcast, I also run the Manchester Austrian Economics Group, and I uh, frequent the Boston Austrian Economics Group. That's Manchester, New Hampshire, and Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, if anyone's listening to this in the area, I urge you to look us up online and stop by. It's a great, great time. But uh, So I I'm very well versed in the economics of the Austrian school. And one thing that I find comes up often among both you know, people ignorant of Austrian economics, and even among some of my favorite Austrian economists, is a confusion between morality and economics. Now, Austrian economics is vert frei. What does this mean? I've, I've used the term a few times. It means that it is value-free. It's a, it's a German term. So, morality does not enter into uh -huh. economics. And this is because economics is a science. Morality does not you know, affect truth in the scientific conception. Now, this is, believe it or not, a controversial fact that the truth doesn't change depending on your ethical views. Because Marxism is founded on something known as class consciousness or class truth where people's ethical standards determine their truth and there, in fact, is no truth outside their their class, their social construct and social standards. All truth is class consciousness, as Marx would say. Whereas, you know, if we wanted to apply this to any other science, obviously it would be absurd. Uh, you know, do you know, do poor people follow different laws of physics? No, obviously not. Um, can a poor person not understand the laws of physics? No, obviously they can. If uh, We want to be objective in studying science. We have to be vert fry value free. And economics is a science. Now, the Austrian school is uh, based around logical deduction. Of course, all sciences are based around logical deduction. Uh, and specifically, it discusses um, the logical deduction from self evident given axioms. And some of these axioms, um, or postulates, more appropriately, are that humans act, that they engage in purposeful behavior, exchange means for ends. That's all really the same iteration of the same statement. That there is a variety of resources. That's the second postulate slash axiom. It, it depends on uh, some of the more philosophical details, which I might get into in a little bit. Uh, the third one is that leisure, leisure is a 
consumer good. And the fourth one is that for-profit firms maximize profit. Uh, and I won't go into economics here. The, you know, this is really a show about libertarianism, about morality, but it's good to just give an overview of Austrian economics and how it is derived from these first principles because often people confuse Austrian economics with libertarianism. That um, you know, someone, for instance, must hate the government if they understand economics. And this is, you know, something that's probably true in my opinion. People who understand economics well do not value the government, the state. But it is not necessary. It is not the same, the same thing to say that you understand economics and that you are a libertarian. For instance, uh, one, one of the theorems in Austrian economics is that uh, government price fixing causes shortages of supply and demand match through the price, supply and demand are ever changing, the price is ever changing, if the price is ever fixed, supply and demand won't m meet. And the you know person who understands Austrian economics could take two different positions on this, uh, that we want supply and demand to meet, so we don't want government price fixing. Or maybe we don't want supply and demand to meet, so we do want government price fixing. Maybe we want a shortage. In fact, some of the first minimum wage laws, these are price fixing laws, were aimed um, or set up as a form of migration barrier to stop uh, recently freed slaves from the south from moving up north. So they set high minimum wages above uh, the natural market wage. And this, uh, you know, this was a policy that was attempted to hurt blacks economically and prevent their movement in the early 20th century. And so the people here understood that there would be a shortage of jobs uh, for blacks down s who were moving up north, down south, if the north imposed minimum wage laws. It would create a, a situation where supply and demand did not meet. There's a shortage, and the shortage would be predominantly experienced by blacks and other immigrants, and so who, who tend to be the lowest paid, and thus uh, minimum wages would outlaw their jobs. So they understood the economics of that situation, at least of that particular aspect of economics, and they used it uh, maliciously, in my opinion, of course, I am a libertarian, and I do not believe in government price fixing of any sort. But you know, the economics is not synonymous with libertarianism. So economics is a, is a vert fry science. Libertarianism is a moral philosophy. This is something that I think everyone should understand. And economics, in a broader sense, does not just deal with what we might call market phenomena, such as giving you know, goods up voluntarily in exchange for other goods, Economics is just uh, the allocation of, of means to achieve ends, which all human action does. You know, you, when you ever you act, you use a means, whether that's your body or some extension of your body, or just your, your mind even, to achieve some end. Whenever an action here being defined as purposeful behavior. But that's not a... Uh, that's not necessarily how all people define action. It's important to, to you know, stick with the definitions you use in any theory, but the definitions themselves are sometimes, uh, you know, you can define things differently without impacting the truth at all in your, your theory. You just have to be consistent in your definitions. You know, do you define, say, um, the... Uh, the market as consisting of all all changes of ownership where both parties consent? Do you define the market as all tra interactions, even if both parties do not consent? Now, of course, there's usually still consent here because even a mugging involves consent, right? Because you can choose to give up your wallet or die. Same with taxes. You can choose to pay taxes or die. So there's still ch some choice, but the state action or all non-market action would then be defined as 
all transactions where um, the cost of one party not undertaking that transaction would be well, really, would be death, right? That's the the state backs everything up with with death. If you um, you know don't do what they say, they'll send you a polite letter. If you don't do it again, they'll send you a you know fine letter. If you don't do it again, they'll put out an arrest warrant for you. If they come and try and arrest you, and you don't let them in, they'll kick down your door. And uh, if you try to defend your home, they will shoot you. This is how the state operates universally. If it did not operate. This way, it wouldn't be much of a state, right? You know, if the state, when someone just didn't pay taxes, decided, oh well, you know, we, we won't go and and violently invade their their home and violently seize their person and put them in a cage, you know, we'll just let them not pay taxes. Uh, that state wouldn't even really be a state per se because it would just be a firm, you know, that you could choose to pay money to, and if you didn't, nothing would would happen to you. So this is one way to find the market in the state, but some people define the market as including the state, right? So, um, you know, when a ruler tyrannizes his subjects, he owns the entire country and is engaging in a market activity. And, uh, you know, state ownership and the means of production, whenever you use that, you're kind of using the secondary definition of the market encompassing everything. You know, these, these definitions you can kind of pick and choose from without fundamentally impacting the theory, right? You know, is, um, for instance, does action mean purposeful behavior, like the Austrians say? Does action mean both purposeful and not purposeful behavior, such as whenever you, you sneeze without meaning to, or, you know, reflexive behavior, such as hitting your knee and your leg going up without you having any control over it. A biologist might define that as action. I'm not up on the, cur the current linguistics in biology, but you know we're not saying they're wrong. We're just saying we choose a different definition. Action is purposeful behavior, and our theory is going to go forward and use this definition consistently. So this is how to arrive at various economic facts in the Austrian method. And um, one of the things the Austrian method doesn't do is make these value judgments that regard itself as a science. And I think any self-respecting science should. Of course, some people refer to Marxism as a science, which doesn't purport to be Vert Fry, which purports that the only truth is class truth. So I wouldn't categorize Marxism as a Vert Fry science. I wouldn't categorize it as much of a science at all. Of course, the word, the word science really just means a methodological study of anything and uh, so yeah it's, it's a methodological study I guess the Marxists are using it's a hor horrible methodology they're using but and so I'll, I'll talk a bit about the Austrian school of economics but there are libertarians um, well there are many libertarians who haven't really thought much about economics and I don't hold that against them as Rothbard once said it's no no crime to be ignorant of economics uh, but, but please don't go spurting your mouth out every single second about economics if you haven't really done much reading on it and you haven't really <laughs> haven't really looked into it because I I find that's often too often the case and luckily libertarians I think are better on this than other political schools of thought but many um, many of the people with the loudest opinions on economics are are also the wrongest <laughs> the most wrong so uh, the Chicago school is another uh, prominent school of economics and um Many self-proclaimed libertarians believe in this. Now, if we're getting to the difference between an anarchist and a libertarian, an anarchy is the ultimate fulfillment of the non-aggression principle that defines libertarianism, at least modern libertarianism. You know, some, some communists called themselves libertarians back in the 20s. Uh, I suppose Sean Hannity is calling himself a libertarianism now, <laughs> a libertarian now. So the, the term uh, really means whatever people use it, but for this purpose of the show, right, libertarian is the non-aggression principle. It's not just a willy-nilly term to be thrown around if we're going to communicate meaningly and have some you know, brand consistency here. That, let, let's not say that Sean Hannity is a libertarian. He, he thinks he is, apparently, or he's just trying to strum up a, 
ratings because he recently called himself one but without changing any of his views. <laughs> you know, it's one thing if he had a conversion, but to just appropriate the name. I, I feel like how the classical liberals must have felt in the, the 20s when liberals started you know, being redefined as socialists. But anyway, um, the Chicago School, most of them are you know, uh, supporters of government at some level, supporters of some taxation. And, and the non-aggression principle really doesn't allow any taxation, right? Um, taxation being defined as a you know, levy on someone that does not arise from their consent, right? Is this a good definition of taxation? We, we can talk more about definitions of taxation later, but right now uh, I'll mainly bring it into the Chicago school. So there are some anarcho-anarchist, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, whatever word you want to use it, people who believe the state um, it would be better if the state ceased to exist. These are, uh, David Friedman is probably the best known Chicago school anarcho-capitalist. I think Patrie Friedman, his son, the seasteading guy, is an ANCAP as well. I'm not positive on that, actually. Uh, so the Chicago school is represented in what I, what I would define as pure non-aggression libertarianism. Now, David Friedman's a consequentialist, so let me, you know, let, let me differentiate here because the non-aggression principle is the deontological view of libertarianism. Now, consequent, consequentialists don't think the non-aggression principle is, is bad per se. A, a few of them do, but most of them just believe, yeah, property rights, um, the non-aggression principle. This is what the de facto world will look like if there's no state. These are consequentialist and caps like David Friedman. So and and you know coupled with the fact that they make all these economics predictions that we'll have much more stuff and there'll be less murder and premature child death and, and all this stuff without the state. So that, that's their basis for arguing for libertarianism, for arguing for the non aggression principle, the absence of a state. And I think the non aggression principle and the absence of the state are really synonymous. These are the same things, right? If there's no state, then the non-aggression principle should be more, more widely followed. Now, obviously, there's still going to be aggression without a state, but there's going to be less of it. And if we don't believe that there's going to be less, you know, less aggression and uh, meddling with private property without the state, then we're not really a narco capitalists, right? You know, there's some people who believe there won't be, you know, any sort of voluntary trade without the state that will all, you know, live in some centrally planned economy. I, I think this is a nonsensical philosophy, but yeah, anarcho-capitalists, David Friedman included, they want there to be less aggression, right, on a moral basis if they're deontological, on an economic basis if they're consequentialist. And again, I think, I think most people are consequentialist in some extent. You know, if if we could aggress against one person, and that would be the difference between humanly existing and humanly non-existent, you know, would, would you do it? You know, these thought experiments come up. And again, as I said at the beginning of the show, luckily, we don't have to deal with them, really, because economics is on the side of libertarianism. But anyway, I've, I've gone into consequentialist libertarianism just uh, to describe, really, David Friedman, who's this main anarcho-capitalist Chicago school supporter, and I won't deny it always a libertarianism, I, I happen to think more highly of the Austrian school than the Chicago school, uh, mostly due to what I believe is their flawed methodology, and most of them use this methodology to achieve false conclusions. I mean, you can use a flawed methodology to arrive at the right conclusion, but it's just by chance, and you know, the Chicago school's methodology is flawed, and they arrive at the wrong conclusions because of it. Their methodology is... Um, pretty much drawing correlations from historical statistics and then matching mathematical uh, constructs, mathematical laws, uh, and verbal constructs and laws that align with this. So you, you look at history, then you, uh, from that, find some mathematical th theorem and, and framework that fits with it, and then you say, this is the truth, this mathematics is the truth. And first of all, 
one grave issue with this is the mathematics describing it isn't necessarily the truth if it makes all these assumptions that aren't true. For instance, um, you know, you could say that I predict there'll be an eclipse in a month, and you know, this is because the because the Roman gods uh, pull the moon around, and so if you make the right prediction, the eclipse happens in a month. You can say, well, yeah, this this theory looks like it works out. Um, I, the correlations we predicted happened, so uh, the Roman gods must exist. This is obviously flawed logic, and a lot of this is uh, is all wrapped around Chicago school economics. Uh, but I will give it to them that they're vert fry. Typically, um, they they use this, these mathematical constructs and ostensibly are vert fry. But the problem with going back and uh, analyzing historical statistics. Is that it's you know inherently impossible to be vert fry uh, when you're looking up at the sky and you see a bunch of stars, you know you're gonna draw and you and someone says draw a constellation. You know if you try and draw a constellation, you're gonna draw something you know, uh, whether or not you're trying to. You're gonna draw something from your own experience. If you, they say draw a mythical beast out of these stars, you're gonna draw a mythical beast from your own experience. But the problem is that. Um, you know, econometrics, the Chicago School method, the statistical method, is really just modern day astrology. They're looking at all these data points, they're drawing lines between them, and then, you know, they're court astrologers. They go back to the king and tell him what he wants to hear, and they make the data fit that. And I don't know how much of this is conscious and how much of it isn't, but this is the typical Chicago School method. Uh, you know, so correlations first of all, don't even imply causation, right? You can go around to a lot of uh, burned out houses with water everywhere and say, well, look, uh, all these houses are burned out and there's water everywhere, so we're going to say that uh, water, you know, is correlated with the burned out houses and the government needs to crack down on, you know, spraying water around, uh, probably ban hoses. Now, obviously, this is nonsense. The water was sprayed on the house during the fire to put it out. So the causation doesn't follow from the correlation. A third factor can cause both, or it could be chance, um, but likely it's a third factor causing both. And this uh, this manifests in a very real way. For instance, in uh, the Chicago School's analysis of the Great Depression, which is that the Federal Reserve did not print enough money. The price level dropped because the Fed didn't print enough money. They didn't engage in enough QE, they didn't engage in enough stimulus, and the depression happened because of that. Because they correlate the falling money supply, the falling price level, and uh, the depression. So the, yes, there is a correlation here between the falling price level and the depression. Now, uh, what they don't you know, really get is that this is, uh, this is like a correlation between the water and the fire, right? The, the falling price level is the cure to the depression. It's the solution to the depression. Um, and we only have to look back at the Depression of 1920 to see uh, how you can have rapidly falling price levels, rapidly shrinking money supplies, tons of bankruptcies, because remember, in a fractional reserve system, any bankruptcy is a reduction in the money supply. And because of this, you can then uh, uh, look and see that the economy recovered very smoothly, very fast. It was even a dr sharper drop in price level and the money supply. Uh, bankruptcies were even higher, but then the economy recovered very quickly. And the Chicago School uh, kind of uh, it doesn't really have a good rebuttal to this. I, even, I asked David Friedman at the last Pork Fest when he was debating Bob Murphy about this. By the way, don't, don't watch the Dave Friedman-Bob Murphy debate. It's a horrible debate. Bob Murphy and Dave Friedman, for some reason, spent the whole time debating about whether we should be consequentialists or uh, deontological libertarians. Uh, deontological means from first principles, you know, um, all men are created equal, this is self-evident. Consequentialist, as I explained, is uh, more utilitarian. Uh, Ludwig von Mises was a consequentialist, and David Friedman, as I said. Uh, but, you know, this is, has nothing to do with economics, right? Economics is not about morality. Economics is not about value, and for some reason they spent half the debate talking about that. So I, I tried to bring it back with a question I asked from the audience. To this depression of 1920, and David Friedman, you know, waved, waved it off, and unfortunately, Bob Murphy didn't, you know, pounce on him then. But the uh, 
you know, the, so the Depression of 1920 uh, shows that, no, these aren't, in fact, correlated. Uh, shrinking price levels don't cause depression because shrinking price levels, that, you know, they don't cause these 10-year depressions because we had price levels fall faster than they did during the Great Depression, but yet the economy rebounded very quickly. And um, you know, if I go into Austrian theory a little, I won't, I won't go into the deep specifics. I, I urge anyone out there who hasn't really studied economics or who has studied economics but not Austrian economics to, um, you know, to visit and read some of uh, probably Man, Economy, and State's a great intro. There's a Bob Murphy study guide that makes it more self-explanatory. There's some shorter works, um, What Has Government Done to Our Money by Rothbard. You know, to really get into these, uh, these subjects, it's, uh, it really gives you a better grasp on the world and a better grasp on uh, why liberty works. Because it's one thing to say liberty is moral, but you know, someone who doesn't believe that liberty is moral will tell you the opposite. And it's a lot easier to convince someone um, you know, using logic about something that's, that's true versus something that's you know, ultimately... I think subjective, right? Uh, morality, um, you know, morality doesn't have an impact on truth. Now, whether you want to say there's one true morality or not, that's kind of a separate issue. But anyway, the, the Austrian theory of the business cycle is that um, as the money supply is expanded by a central bank, the um, interest rate is lowered. It is essentially price fixing, and there's ends up like with every price fixing, there's a shortage of something, and that shortage is savings, uh, real savings. So the price fixing uh, happens, and the, the government can fix prices this way in another industry. Say, suppose it opens up a um, you know a, f a milk store where the government just sells milk for like ten cents a gallon, and you know this is obviously heavily subsidized, and it puts all the other milk stores out of business. Uh, this is pretty much what the Fed does. You know, it offers these ultra, you know, ultra big cash infusions that you know, set the market price because it's such a big actor. And the you know, the government, if it was doing this with milk, it could, you know, adjust the price day to day and try to uh, you know work the price out so there are fewer shortages. But obviously there would still be horrible, horrible shortages, right? Um, because the government has fixed the price of milk too low. Um, and it, you know it's it's a different example really. But, uh, yeah, the shortage here from price fixing affects savings. And so savings are not, um, don't think of savings in terms of money. Think of savings in terms of resources. So the physical resources that are in the economy, you know, all this steel, all this land, all these mines, all these, you know, all the oil, all the cars, all the machines, all the machines that make the machines, these are all resources. And resources can be used towards either consumption or they can be used uh, to invest in further production. And savings is when instead of consuming a resources, you know, instead of buying a leather couch or a, um, you know, going to a strip club and blowing all your money, uh, you instead invest to produce even more resources in the future. So, you know, maybe you open up a, a business or you invest in a business or you build a new factory or you, um, you know, loan money to someone who's building a new factory or you buy, um, you know, buy a house and rent it out. These are all investments versus consumption. And so uh, investment slash saving, these are really the same things. And saving can also be just, you know, hoarding, as the Keynesians would say, hoarding gold. This is saving. And it also, uh, you know, it means resources are not being consumed when you hoard gold instead of spending it on something. And it means those resources uh, will thus have a lower price since you're not bidding on them and they'll be used for, you know, investment or consumption elsewhere, but it does, uh, you know, even hoarding money uh, helps with investment, so, since you're not consuming. Now, um, <clears throat> the shortage of savings means that um, there's a credit crunch, and this is the start of any depression, is uh, pretty much the Fed floods the market with all this, uh, you know, loose, loose credit. Uh, people take out a huge amount of loans. So they're all consuming resources uh, in these loans. And they do not, um, they don't have enough resources, right? They, they consume a bunch with these loans and, you know, uh, 
sometimes they invest a bunch kind of uh, in long-term distant projects but there's no resources being saved for this and so eventually you know the market catches up with this and the people who have invested in all these long-term projects you know suddenly realize that wait people haven't been investing in middle-term projects actually they've been consuming things and there's a credit crunch that um, happens and the economy can only recover when the amount of savings goes back up and this means interest rates go through the roof you know the opposite of what the fed's doing uh, this also means there's going to be bankruptcies and a reduction in the money supply in any fractional reserve system and thus the price level dropping and this is a uh, you know this is a depression and until uh, the shortage is alleviated until the amount of savings catches back up and this means that um, interest rates have to go up right it, people need to be incentivized to save you won't save if there's a zero percent interest rate you know why would you you're throwing money away especially if inflation is like 2.8 percent so pretty much the opposite of what the fed is doing and what the fed did and what the chicago school recommends the fed should have done a lot more of during the great depression right they wanted the fed to print so much money that you know instead of interest rates skyrocketing the interest rates would be lower instead of the money supply shrinking the money supply would be uh, you know constant and the price level instead of falling would be constant but uh, this cannot alleviate the shortage this is like um, you know if there's a shortage of shoes caused by price fixing you know it's like um, just lowering the the price of shoes the government mandated price of shoes even more it's it's exacerbating the problem it's not solving it and so uh, the Chicago School is wrong on this, and I think they're wrong because of methodology, because their methodology is flawed, because they work on correlations, on mathematical theories and inferences rather than causation. And the Austrian School, of course, is a school modeled after uh, deduction, logical deduction, using uh, you know the same logic that's used in in physics and math and all these these sciences, um, but. You know, instead of the givens being some set of uh, historical statistics, and then uh, then trying to you know draw these constellations in the sky based on them and, and come up with these correlative correlation theories, or instead of doing experiments, right? Because experiments is an, is another way to achieve scientific truth. You can use the experimental method, which is what most people mean by the scientific method. But you can only do this if you have a control group. So you can't experiment with cities because there's no identical city anywhere you can't even really do this with individuals or small groups because there's no identical small group although you know you can make predictions that are more accurate if you use uh, behavioral psychology experiments you know th these aren't totally pointless you can figure out some things but it's not going to give you any absolute truth it's it, and you can't even begin to do an experiment on the level of the cities you know all the data has to be thrown out uh, there's no control group you can't pick two cities that are the same. You can't do one policy to a city and then after that say, well, we'll try another and see how that does it. No, because the city after that policy is a completely different city. Everything's changed. There's no ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus, meaning all things equal, is the, the main fault of equilibrium theory, the Chicago School model. And uh, it's mostly a... Uh, Assumption. Well, you know, I, I don't really want to go into economics too much more on this podcast. I advise anyone to check out the Boston Austrian Economics Group. That's MisesBoston.com or the Manchester Austrian Economics Group. You can find that one on Facebook. And uh, come to our meetings. You know, we, we Google Hangout, the Manchester Group. There's Google Hangouts. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing to get involved in. Uh, the Mises Institute, you know, is great. Uh, sometimes I differ with them on some things, but... Uh, you know, Li Liberty Me has a lot of resources. Um, there's uh, there's lots of good good things to read about economics out there. And uh, if anyone's interested or has any specific theories, feel free to comment in the YouTube below, and I'll I'll go over them. But so that that was really the first part of the show, uh, discussing economics in general and discussing the vert fry nature of economics. And uh, the main fault in my view of the Chicago School over the Austrian School is that it is impossible to be Vert Fry if you're just, you know, looking up at the stars and drawing constellations. It's impossible to be Vert Fry uh, in this manner. You're always going to, you know, let your biases slip in or intentionally bias the data. 
uh, what, this is a great Huffington Post article, uh, How the Fed Bought and Sold the Economics Profession, where pretty much every single uh, economics professor is directly paid out of an endowment financed by the Fed. So, yeah, I mean, um, a little conflict of interest there, and uh, obviously some of these correlational data is going to support Fed policies or further Fed intervention, or especially the existence of the Fed. <laughs> They never say it should go away. I mean, Milton Friedman said the Fed should be replaced by a computer, but you know he wanted that computer to print more money. So yeah, QE wasn't even big enough for the real Chicago schoolers because the price level still fell. Even in 2007, the price level fell, and they uh, they would say that you have to you know, keep the price level constant. And you know, the whole notion of a statistical number price level is pretty absurd on its surface. Um, you know, are prices going up or down? Well, I mean, uh, for 3D printers are going way down for you know laser printers they were two thousand dollars a couple years ago now they're a hundred bucks at walmart prices are going down in some sectors and up in some other sectors and to pick some sectors and not others to include in your statistics is inherently biased right you have to be biased to uh, come up with any statistical price level the bias creeps in whether or not you're trying to be biased and it's impossible for it not to so you know uh, we've had ten thousand percent deflation in the last 15 years if you look at the price of USB drive data. So, it, you know, when you base your methodology on statistics, when you base your methodology on correlations drawn from statistics, it's going to be biased. It's not going to be vert fry, even if you're trying to be vert fry. Whereas um, logical deduction using, uh, using tried and true logical proofs that are, you know, good enough for mathematics, so I think they should be good enough for economics. Uh, is another way to get at truths in economics, and I think it's one way that, um, you know, since you can show absolute truth uh, based on self-evident axioms, um, self-evident postulates, if you want to be more of a, an Aristotelian empiricist rather than a Kantian a priorist, it's a very philosophical debate, but you can uh, get at some theories in this way, and uh, so, for instance, uh, all humans act, all humans exchange means for ends. Um, humans, uh, since there's a diversity of resources, this means uh, humans will act. They will exchange means for ends. And if uh, other people are part of these resources that in a market society, they will exchange means for ends and trade with these other people. And, uh, you know, you can keep on drawing out using logical deduction at each step, you know, citing your logical claim. And in this way, get to some of the more, more nuanced and advanced theories of Austrian economics. You know, f uh, and logical deduction is really the only way to um, approach some economic problems. Statistical analysis simply doesn't give you things like the economic calculation problem. And that's why it's sadly missing from the, you know, the free marketers of the Chicago School are not talking about the calculation problem when they should be. Uh, you know, every, every free marketer, that should be one of their first leaps to in a debate with the status is the calculation problem. But the calculation problem is not derived through statistics. The economic calculation problem is, as Mises first formulated, Ludwig von Mises, is that uh, in order to figure out the most efficient way to do anything, you have to be able to um, you know, compare uh, different things. You have to be able to compare, say, a, um, you know, one laptop with another. And you, know, you can compare how good these are in the production process, but to compare their cost, to compare the cost of one laptop versus another, um, you need some sort of number, right? Uh, the, the cost of, say, using one metal versus another metal in your car. You need to know the cost of these metals. Uh, you need to have a number for these. But you can't, you can't add apples and oranges. You can't add metal and labor. You can, though, add their prices. And the price mechanism is the only known mechanism for adding um, you know, non-homogenous and different goods, adding apples and oranges. You can use prices. And in this way, uh, calculate. Without prices, you can't calculate. What are prices? Prices are the exchange ratio in voluntary transactions, uh, transactions where ownership changes hands. So the fact that ownership is changing hands in transactions means that uh, there is not ownership by a central organization, right? 
there is not ownership by a central organization that is preventing any uh, sub ownership, any two people from trading. So these transactions aren't being prevented. If they were, then no market price could emerge. Furthermore, there isn't one entity that owns everything because if there was, then there would be no ability for it to transact and thus no market prices could arise, no economic calculation could come into being. Uh, yeah, that's the economic calculation problem in a nutshell, but you know, this is all derived from logic and uh, it's not something that you can look at, say, the Soviet Union and go, okay, well, because you know its GDP did this and its price level did this, people need money and private property in order to calculate. There's just no way uh, you know, to get at that theory from that without using logical deduction. So I think logical deduction is important. It's fundamental for anyone preaching liberty because we need to be you know, both consequentialists and deontologists when we preach liberty. We need to explain the benefits of it, I think, and we need to explain the morality of it. Um, some people disagree on the latter, but I think everyone agrees on the former. But you know, to explain the benefits of it, you need to understand economics. This isn't a, a moral thing saying that uh, there will be more resources, saying that you know we couldn't even imagine computers arising in a fully communist world. They just couldn't calculate enough to be able to produce them. So these are you know, the important reasons to study vert fry economics, but also to distinguish it from uh, moral libertarianism. Moral libertarianism is, uh, I think, probably the main goal for most of us. Uh, you know, it's give me liberty, give, or give me death, not give me liberty or, uh, you know, give me an economy with a GDP that's 10% higher than it would be with liberty. <laughs> it's uh, an interesting, um, an interesting debate to have, but luckily, uh, you know, luckily we can preach both, right? It's not exclusive. You don't have to be a consequentialist talking about economics or a deontologist talking about morality. You can talk about both, and I think everyone should talk about both. Um, I mean, you know, if you're a moral nihilist, I, I do have friends who are moral nihilists, so I don't, you know, I don't stress at them that they should be talking about the non-aggression principle if they don't want to, if they want to stick to economics. You know, Michael Chan is a great, great kid. Claims a moral nihilist, but understands economics. So hey, you know that's good enough for me um, because you arrive at the NAP if you do understand economics. Now, of course, if you're a moral nihilist and you don't understand economics, you can arrive at some pretty terrible other political systems, as history has shown. So, you know, I, I don't, I myself think a deontological libertarianism is at the very least useful, if not true. Um, so, Vert Fry economics. Vert Fry, libertarian, or uh, non-Vert Fry libertarianism, value-free economics, non-value-free libertarianism, so values are imbibed in libertarianism. And what does this mean? So when we talk about something like uh, what will happen when the state falls, if there's no state, well, there's a uh, morals don't really enter into that equation right because um you know it's the whole is ought problem we can say what i think you know should happen in a in a just world you know maybe, maybe this is what god should do and he's god's immoral if he doesn't <laughs> this is nonsensical to think about morality does not impact truth uh so you know what will happen when the state disappears is an economic question uh not a moral question and maybe the the end situation will be more moral, certainly uh, we all here think so on the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network, but these are two different arguments and it's important to make that distinction. And um, uh, I, I'm recently, uh, I've started a Man, Economy, and State reading group, Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard, and uh, we're reading this in the, the Boston Austrian Economics Group and the Manchester Austrian Economics Group. Uh, it's a great, great book. And uh, one thing I think he slips on sometimes is not being Vert Fry enough. Uh, you know, he preaches Vert Fry, but sometimes he'll slip and uh, make an argument that, you know, for instance, because fractional reserve banking is fraud and immoral, then it doesn't exist in the market and won't exist without the state. But this is a, a non sequitur, right? Uh, morality doesn't have anything to do with, with what will happen in the market after the state falls. Um, 
you know, I don't think you can de facto eliminate even such things as slavery, although I think certainly, um, you know, humans know more about themselves than other people know about them, and so uh, when humans are allowed to control themselves, they produce more, and so I think it's, the market would tend to drift away from slavery, and history kind of showed this. You know, slavery was kind of doomed in the South even before the Civil War. But the... Um, you know, you can't, I think, say because slavery is morally bad and, uh, you know, libertarianism is morally good, then in a libertarian society there will be no slavery. That, again, that's a, that's a non sequitur. Um, you know, what you have to talk about is the economics of the situation, the value-free economics of what will happen when the state disappears. Um, will there still be um, murder? I, I don't think I run into any libertarianism saying there will never be another murder as soon as the state disappears. Uh, will there still be fraud? Sure. Um, will Will there be less of it than there is today? Less aggression? Well, it's you know it's hard to quantify aggression, but yeah, uh, there's there certainly would be um, certainly all the instances of state aggression. I think amount to you know uh, a far greater evil than uh, than all the private aggression. You know, it's it's hard to add up moral rights and wrongs, but uh, yeah, we would we wouldn't be moving towards a stateless society, uh, or we wouldn't be preaching a stateless society here at the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network if we didn't um, think there would be less overall aggression. But that doesn't mean there'll be no aggression, and there could even be systemic aggression, right? Um, if you consider fraud to be a violation of the non-aggression principle, then what are fortune tellers? Fortune tellers, you know, are making a fraudulent claim that they can tell the future, and you're paying them money, and when they're wrong, you can, uh, what should you have recourse to demand your money back? No, the market's more complicated than that. I don't think any libertarians would be for banning fortune telling. I think it's hard to reconcile uh, it with the non-aggression principle, but you know the market's more nuanced than the non-aggression principle, and I think there will be um, you know ostensible violations because remember the market doesn't run off some philosopher king. You know Rothbard's not directing this thing. There's no central planning agency that prevents fractional reserve banks from starting. Uh, you, we can say that fractional reserve banks wouldn't be. Uh, you know, stable enough to survive in the market. Uh, there are some Austrians I respect, such as Selgin, who says otherwise. But you know, that's a different argument from fractional reserve banks are fraud, and thus fr and fraud wouldn't exist in the market. You know, that's that's nonsense. Uh, even systemic fraud can exist in the market. You know, ongoing perpetual fraud, such as the fortune telling industry. <laughs> I'm I'm really harsh towards fortune tellers on the show, I guess. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a good example, and fractional reserve. Banking is another example. Uh, is fractional reserve banking against the non-aggression principle? Um, you know, uh, there's arguments on both sides. Uh, let me point out, I think, institutions that are similar to fractional reserve banks. Um, you know, one would be uh, airlines. Airlines overbook airlines. And, you know, uh, if you show up, if everyone really showed up who bought a ticket, not everyone could get on the plane, right? So you could say the airline's committing fraud, right? Well, not really, because on the back of the ticket, they explain this all, and, you know, legal terms and um, the bank does the same when you open an account it explains um, it explains to you that uh, I, I used to be a bank teller actually they don't um, so I know a little bit about this the demand deposit accounts they don't have to return for 45 days I believe um, and the savings accounts are 60 days so you don't necessarily have your money right away so you know uh, it kind of depends on the fine print um, maybe another situation would be a gym that uh, promises towels to all its members, but if all its members really showed up at the same time, there wouldn't be enough towels. Um, well, if they put it in the fine print, and you know, even if they don't put it in the fine print, um, this, these situations could still exist on the market. You know, maybe uh, you're, you know, you think you've been wrong, but it's not enough for you to go, uh, you know, go sue them over, and so maybe you, you say, I'll stop doing business with this gym because I showed up once and there weren't any towels. You know, maybe the gym will lose patronage, maybe it won't, um, but the market's a little messier than a strict adherence to the non-aggression principle, and that's why it's important to talk about vert fry economics and vert fry truth, value-free truth, value-free economics. Vert fry meaning value-free for anyone just tuning in. So that is my spiel on Bert Fry economics. I will finish out the hour by giving um, giving a little sneak peek of my panel I'll be doing at Porkfest, 
we will have a panel at Porkfest uh, at the Alt Expo tent. Alt Expo is technically a different event than Porkfest. This is in uh, Lancaster, New Hampshire. It will be coming up on, I believe, the 27th. Uh, that's Saturday. I might have that date wrong. But anyway, uh, Saturday after tomorrow, there will be a panel involving me and then uh, two of my uh, good friends, Tabor Baranti and Michael Valchik. And this is the panel that Porkfest didn't want you to see. It's, um, you know, at, at first I was told by the organizer of Porkfest that we couldn't do this panel because it would be too controversial. You know, maybe the, the feds would invade if we did this panel or they'd bomb Porkfest or something. I thought it was a paranoid delusion. I think they're, they're really more worried about their tax exempt status, but which they got denied. But anyway, um, you know, this is just going to be about the non aggression principle, really kind of an extension of this radio show, just discussing various aspects of the non aggression principle, various uh, questions. And um, this should be videotaped. I'll try and get this video up online. Um, I might even put this up as my next episode if we have a good video of this. And I think uh, it should be a fun time. Um, we might, and there's no promise of this, but we might have Larkin Rose and Josie the Outlaw stop by as panelists as well. Uh, they, they haven't completely confirmed that, but it's a possibility. And, um, you know, we, we won't pull any punches. We'll be going into some of the more uh, deep questions around the NAP, some of the more controversial questions. We won't be using any specific names, of course, for legal reasons, or uh, we won't be talking about any governments that exist today. We won't be talking about any um, people that exist today or, or even places. Uh, really, we're trying to keep this abstract, but we're not going to pull any punches. You know, We're going to discuss, for instance, uh, Cantwell's theory that anyone who draws a, a paycheck from a government is, is fair game for you know, violence, um, force, and uh, a sneak peek, my my disproval of this is a reducto ad absurdum. Um, you know, what about a socialist society where every, um, you know, everyone works for the government is then the non-aggression principle, does that just justify all violence um, against everyone, anyone doing violence anywhere is, is justified? Uh, no, obviously the non-aggression principle would break down, but if it breaks down in some society, it's not really a principle. It's a, you know, a principle is, is something that is a law, right? It's a general uh, fact that is not just relevant to a few specific cases, but all cases. And so if the non-aggression principle uh, really uh, is a law, is a principle, then uh, then no, Cantwell's theory is wrong because it breaks down in the case of fully socialized societies. Um, so, you know, it needs to at least be prefaced by some people who draw a paycheck from the government in order to reconcile it with a non-aggression principle. Because remember, a principle has to be universal. A principle has to be something that is applicable to all circumstances, and principle and laws are really synonymous here. So, you know, uh, the government might say it created a law, but if the law doesn't apply to individuals in the government exactly as it does to every individual, then it's not a law, it's not a principle that the government is enforcing. It's, um, you know, it's just a, you know, command from a an overseer to his his oversaw his subject his slave and because the non-aggression principle is a principle if it, since it applies everywhere it has to also apply in socialist societies and uh, so no just because you draw a paycheck from the government and the government is a taxing slash stealing agency uh, that does not mean that everyone who draws a paycheck from the government is target for aggression or not aggression, as Campbell would say, but force. Uh, so uh, we'll debunk that, um, but we will get into some other interesting questions, such as no-knock raids, um, you know, are you, uh, such as foreign troops maybe occupying a country, um, you know, such as maybe the mechanic, uh, the, the person who cleans the toilets at Auschwitz, if he has full knowledge of what's going on, is he a target for force? Uh, Hey, you know, Auschwitz couldn't operate without any toilets for the guards, so uh, they're kind of essential there. You know, these are all interesting questions. We're going to really get into it. Um, we're going to have a few different perspectives on the panel. I think Tabor's kind of leaning for more of a pacifist angle. Michael, I think, is really going to get into uh, vert fry versus non-vert fry, where, you know, if we're talking about something like uh, will a revolution be successful, this has absolutely nothing to do with will a rev is revolutionary, you know, force violence uh, moral. And so, no. Um, he, he's going to kind of take the same position I do and say uh, this is not synonymous and um, I think he might be a little a little harder on the NAP uh, and some people, or at least the popular conception of the NAP is, is dictating a stateless society. 
than I am. But uh, anyway, and then I, I, I'll be bringing up the, the viewpoints that I have brought up already in the show. Maybe I'll come up with some new view, viewpoints. Maybe I'll change my mind before then. You know, uh, talking to people at Porkfest is always a fun time. I recommend anyone goes to Porkfest who hasn't been. It's a fantastic venue, fantastic group of people. Um, just because they banned uh, an author you like, I won't mention any names, <laughs> doesn't mean you shouldn't go. Uh, they've only banned one one person at least. So I'm still going and throwing my weight behind Porkfest. And uh, you know maybe that'd be different if they tried to censor my Alt Expo panel, but yeah, they've just banned Cantwell. So I'm, uh, I'm still still going although i do have some friends who are boycotting and i don't necessarily hate hate them or blame them for boycotting i see their reasons but uh yeah i'll um i'll be going and i recommend that anyone else here go too i think it's a uh, 50 dollars i believe for a day you know i don't actually know the prices off the top of my head just look it up pork fest and um yeah so this is a uh, this is scholarly sedition uh your host andrew Krishon signing off and uh, this has been another show on the Voluntary Virtue 